Well, thank you for attending this town hall meeting. It's our first town hall meeting we put together. My name is Duke Gomez Shemp. I work with the People's Press Project. We're a partner in putting this together. Today we have a panel with local leaders, uh, including clergy, immigrant right advocates, a dreamer, and a local immigration attorney. And they're here to lead the discussion to answer questions about the application process for the impact of the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans, which is DAPA, and the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, which is called DACA. Um, the meeting is informational, and it's not a debate on immigration. We're here to bring community leaders together that are knowledgeable about immigration to get the information out to the public. Our goal is to bring our community together and talk about the impacts and the details of this program. And there's a very small group, so I think we should take this opportunity to go around the room and have you introduce yourselves. So what we'd like you to do is tell us your name and if you represent an organization. And if you feel comfortable, tell us why you're here. You're here because you want more information. You're here because you have a family member that you would like to get the information for, or you're just here to listen. So let's start over here and do some introductions. <coughs> sure, I'll start. Uh my wife is an immigration attorney, so I'm here to listen to what she has to say. So, I am Tia, and I am the daughter of said immigration attorney. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Laura Dronin. Um, I'm working at Senator Heidkamp's office, and uh, Cora and I are both just hired uh, to work with immigration cases, and I'm here to learn. I'm Cora Boinger, and I'm also working as field rep in Senator Heidkamp's office with Laura, so. Uh, my name is Aduak. Uh, I'm one of those students here, but I'm not in the leadership, but I'm here to get a glimpse of what's going on here. And thanks for the bearing on when I first come, was my uh, uh, sponsor when I get here. Very mm -hmm. My name is Sister Lucy. I'm working with the Hispanic community at St. Francis de Sales Catholic Church in in Morehead. So I'm representing the Hispanic community. I'm Fanny Sanders, and I work with the ELL students in Fargo Public Schools. My name is Elizabeth Kiddos, and I'm here with my mother and my father, and have them speak on English. They try to help out. Well, the format today is we're going to have the panelists give a kind of a brief introduction and we're going to, after that, we're going to basically open it up for questions and answers. So it's really going to be a, a town hall where we talk to each other. But we have some information from all the panels to present at the beginning to kind of get us focused and, and to get us tuned into what we're talking about. So, so panelists. We're going to start off with Barry here, so I'll let you go first. Okay, and I always like to hear what everybody else says. <laughs> And I conjure up my, my thoughts of that, so this is going to be a challenge for me. And, and also, I wanted to be here because I thought, oh, this is great. I, I get to sit amongst experts and learn along mm -hmm. the way. So um, I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm also glad that you all are outnumbering us up here. Um, it's it's uh, at least uh, shows the, the interest in the topic. And I'm just going to talk about, uh, like I said, I'm not really an immigration expert other than from experience in the sense that. I began working um, many years ago in the refugee resettlement program at Lutheran Social Services. And that was really my educational program from that point on. That's what that I call it my transformative uh, education. I'm a social worker by training, uh, and that gave me some basics, but it really was working with people from around the world and our own system and helping the two uh, merge that was uh, a really uh, an ongoing part of uh, my education. Um, so we worked uh, with a, with the refugee resettlement program, which was sanctioned by the um, the uh, State Department. Uh, we work with admitting, uh, legally admitted uh, refugees, those who meet the, the definition of a refugee. Uh, eventually also developed a immigration program, working with people either who arrived originally as refugees who needed some assistance in some additional immigration status updates as they were living here longer, or, and then it, it evolved into working with other people coming into the country uh, other than refugees who needed some help with their, with their status. And I would just have to say from the outset, even with the being a, a fairly organized um, 
system by which refugees are both admitted to the country and then assisted in their adjustment to the country, our U.S. immigration system is the most horrifically complicated, complex system that one could ever have contrived. And then you put people from around the world who are trying to save themselves out of really horrific situations and trying to manage through that horrific system, and you just have a prescription for lots of disasters and personal tragedies. So that's kind of my outset observation. So it was always incredible. We really did celebrate every time somebody came off the, air, the airplane and had managed to get through, they were they were, had met the definition of a refugee, which was to have fear or actual persecution in their country of origin, and they had to really present the facts as to why they would meet that definition. And then they'd have to meet the United States prescription of who they were admitting into the country at the time. And it was a very controversial time when I was working because there was people that were, were being readily admitted from places like Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, and then it evolved into um, some of the uh, African countries, Eastern European countries. It was a very political process because at the same time, people were not being admitted from uh, Central American countries, where many, many of the same situations were uh, occurring in those countries as were occurring in the countries where we were receiving refugees. Um, but there was so it, it became clear very early on that there was a very strong political process that was used in determining who was coming into the country and who would not be allowed to come in. Our role in as Lutheran Social Services was to assist under a, a government a description refugees when they first arrived here. You can imagine uh, probably living in a refugee camp for months, maybe even years, uh, after fleeing your country of origin. Uh, probably with family, uh, no property, very little resources, and now kerplunk down in a totally foreign land. Um, one starts seemingly with very little, and so it was up to the staff and volunteers with Lutheran Social Services to try to provide for basic needs, housing, food, clothing, uh, referrals to English. English certainly was one of the most important aspects of, of adapting to a new country. Orientation about uh, the United States. And I still remember doing a half-day orientation about, and this is getting going back again to the 80s, we did a half-day orientation on the US, U.S. healthcare system. Can you imagine explaining the U.S. healthcare system um, to somebody from another country? Um, we got more confused as we went along than our, the people we were trying to inform. Um, but that was, it, it was really trying to do a, a um, a real short course in this is the kind of information you're going to need living in a new country in terms of getting your children into school, getting your own English established, getting a job. Job was, was job one. People needed to get employment as soon as possible what, upon coming into the country. Um, and then just trying to learn about or teach them about the customs of, of our, our country. What we found along the way was that our own community was also adapting to this this change that was occurring. At times, I think they believed to them that somehow this was happening to them, not, not with them. There was an incredible amount of support and, and help that the community extended, uh, but then as the numbers increased, as it became clear that the community needed to step up in more ways than one, there got to be some uh, need for uh, orientation of the community as well. Why are these people here? Why are they coming? in the method they, that they are coming. Um, shouldn't they learn English before they get here? I mean, that was a question we heard over and over and over again. You know, that's fine to bring them here, but they should have, they should have learned English prior to coming, uh, including their children. Um, can't you screen out people with disabilities? I mean, you know, there was those kinds of things that we needed to be talking about. This is what the U.S. refugee uh, policy is. This is the kind of responsibilities that uh, receiving organizations have. The, responsibilities that churches have, the responsibilities that new Americans have. And, and I think one of the things, one of my learning experiences along the way was that we, we um, underestimated the resilience and strength of people that came here. We at times treated them as somebody who had basic, no basic need, uh, uh, abilities at all. And found out, I found out very quickly that I was being taught as much as teaching uh, through that process. And, and so I think there was, a, there was kind of this evolving experience on both sides. I think it's an ongoing kind of thing. Um, refugees have been coming to this country under a, a subscribed uh, 
program through the State Department since World War II. So this is not some kind of recent phenomenon, and it has continued to this day. And I stress again, as much as we don't, um, I don't want to make a strong distinction between people who are here undocumented and people who are here legally, uh, because I think many of their circumstances are the same, and I don't want to be somehow throwing one group under the bus. But I have to always make sure that people understand that there are people coming here, and they are here legally. And whether they were resettled originally into our community or lately, a lot of people have been resettled elsewhere in the country. And just like us Americans, they have freedom to move. So they may be resettled in Texas and choose to move to Fargo, and that's their option. They can do that. And there's nothing telling them where they need to go and where they need to stay, where they need to uh, put down roots. Um, so that's really very quickly. There, there's one experience, though, as I was thinking about this today, where I'm proud of the organization that I did work with for 20 years, and that was when the first time we got a call saying we have a 15-year-old um, young man from El Salvador in the jail in Washington, and what are we going to do? And he, he was on his way to Canada, and he got caught. And I, my, that, you know, again, being working with an agency that we're very clear about, we work with people who have been legally admitted to the United States, I felt I needed to go to my director and say, what should we do? We have, we have a call saying this young man needs help. Um, and our director at the time, this is still about 10, 15 years ago, said, well, what, what does our mission statement say? You know, of course, I pull it out and read it and read it to him. And he said, OK. And I said, that, that means we are supposed to do this, right? He said, of course, we can do this. So um, I was proud because it was like, you know, the hell with the status of this young man, this young man needed help, and we did assist him through that laborious situation. I don't work at Luther Social Service anymore, but my connection to the New American population continues very strong. And then I've had incidents along the way. Um, a few years ago, and this is kind of what presents uh, to ourselves, that I got a call, actually I got a call from my daughter in St. Paul, who said, I hope you don't mind, but I told my pastor that he was looking for somebody to work with these um, uh, human traffic victims who were in the Cass County Jail. And he had gone up and visited them and found, heard their stories and how horrific it was. And they had been uh, human trafficked into the United States. Um, they were trapped in a horrible situation in Alabama, Texas. They managed to escape. And they ended up working for a plant, building a plant outside of Castle. And the minute they were done finishing the construction project, immigration came in and arrested them being here illegally, and they were in the Cass County Jail. Uh, I remember reading it in the paper and thought, huh, he's from India, go figure, um, and then didn't think any more of it. And then my daughter got me involved, and I met the people. And I'll talk a little bit more about this, but I think the one thing that concerns me the most on the immigration debate is our ability to dehumanize the people that we're talking about. And it's very, very easy to do. I've done it many times. If I think about them in terms of the numbers, and particularly if there's somebody who's really good at interjecting some fear about them and somehow they're here to hurt us, uh, I can be easily swayed. But when you get to know the individuals, which happened to me with these, well, they were all ages, men from India, and heard their stories and what, the, what had happened to them, you cannot turn away. And you have the opportunity to not be afraid, uh, but be involved in a really helpful way. My story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Barry. Um, I would like for Julie to, to go next and, <coughs> and tell his story. Um, this is Julie Nagmi II, yeah. and uh, I'll let you introduce yourself and tell us what happened in your life. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Julie Nagmi II, um, originally from Liberia, West Africa. Um, let me start it off like this. Uh, I'm here today to talk about you know, uh, how did I get on the junior scholarship and uh, DACA program. First thing is, I'd like to give glory to Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. He is a very purpose and direct reason why I'm here in the first place. Um, though I've been perfect, not worthy of his grace and mercy. Nevertheless, I give him all thanks, glory, and honor, and praise. Um, secondly, I would like to thank uh, 
This is Anna Marie Stinson, our immigration lawyer, but actually she's really a close friend of our family. Without her, I don't know uh, if we if I would even be here right now. So she's worked tirelessly. I mean, I've never seen such a person, especially like uh, when it comes to lawyers and stuff. Because we dealt with a bunch of lawyers back in Florida and it wasn't pretty, but this lady has been a friend more than even a lawyer, so I, I'm really grateful to uh, to her work. Um, and also, um, the way how my story went is my dad came here as a student to, uh, to Duke University to get his master's in uh, divinity. And he had a full ride scholarship through the United Methodist Church. And at the time, we had three other siblings, uh, a little brother and two little sisters, mom. And um, he left us behind for a year to kind of establish himself here in America while going to school and trying to understand the American system and things like that. And then a year later, that was 1998, uh, he filed for all of us to come, you know, me, my brother, sister, and my mom, both sisters. So when we got here, we was I was nine years old, so I was the oldest out of all the four of us. Um, we came as students on J2 visas, and we was going to school, through the public school system, started out in North Carolina, Wilmington, beautiful out there, nice beaches, I love that out there. At the time, we, we didn't appreciate the beauty because it was culture shock, um, you know, being out of Africa and seeing people walking around every day to being in the suburb where people don't come outside at all. We're like, wow, what's going on? We're stuck in the house. But now I appreciate where, I, you know, where we started off. And then, uh, you know, all the way through uh, through school, we was all, we was in status. We had this J two visa. We was, we had our social security numbers. Uh, we was able to you know go through life you know, as almost like a normal American until uh, when I graduated out of high school. Uh, that was like two thousand eight, and then I found out actually before I graduated, uh, we was thrown out of status, and I didn't I didn't know all the, the things that happened because I was too young, wasn't paying attention to that, wasn't focused on it, so I don't know how we got out of status, but my dad explained to me that um, he applied to you know, pretty much renew our status, but the immigration, like uh, the gentleman explained, pastor explained earlier that how complex it is, and for me, I don't really focus on the complexity of it, so all I know is that I got kicked out of status and I couldn't go to school. And, uh, and I, well, I, I wasn't qualified to get any federal aid. Though I graduated uh, with a 3.4 GPA, had scholarships to go to a couple of schools to even uh, play soccer and uh, for school. I wasn't able to actually um, get the federal aid to help pay for my school, and so I couldn't go to school for six years. And uh, so, I mean, life almost seemed like it, it, it stopped right there, you know, when I graduated. Like, man, all my buddies are going out to college and everybody getting a scholarship and playing soccer, doing what they love to do. And I was just sitting there like, oh, man. So, you know, obviously, you know who I turned to, turned to the Lord, you know. And just started doing missionary work in Georgia. Started helping the polis from uh, India. And just just doing, doing some Christian work and just waiting for God to make a move and help us, help us out. Fast forward, uh, my dad decided to come to uh, North Dakota. I didn't want to come to North Dakota. I wanted to stay in Georgia. Uh, first of all, I heard it was cold. <laughs> I hate the cold. Uh, secondly, um, everything I knew was in Atlanta, Georgia, so I wanted to stay. But so um, at that time, uh, the biggest motivation for me to come up here was I was facing, at the age of 21, I was facing deportation hearing. Uh, I just got a random letter in the mail one day. A guy who never gets any mail. <laughs> I'm always, you know, just having fun. All of a sudden, this mail appeared in my uh, mailbox, telling me that I'm facing deportation. I need to show up in court. And at that time, my dad was already in Fargo, so I called him like, "Dad, I got this letter. It said they um I'm supposed to get deported." <laughs> I was like, uh, "What's going on here?" So uh, after I called him, and I went, I showed up to a couple of the hearings by myself. First time I've ever appeared in court for anything, so I was just like scared, you know. Um, then uh, after that, my dad said, uh, "Do whatever it takes to just come up here because we have a lawyer at the time." You know, he was talking about. I think 
he had another lawyer before he was handled. But anyway, um, he told me to come up here and we was gonna work it out because I was constantly like, at that time I had to stay in the shadows. You know, I was I wasn't doing anything wrong because I had this uh, this um, deportation here and I just had to pretty much lay low. Everywhere I turned, it seemed like the police was after me. You know, literally because they would always pull me over and like, hey, where's your driver's license? And because I wasn't. Uh, because I'm facing deportation here, all my paperwork is all expired. Constantly in trouble, paying heavy fines. I think I don't pay over four thousand dollars just in like uh, fines and fees, trying to just go to work and support and try to help my family, help myself. And then uh, to fast forward the story, uh, I don't like to talk too much. I know we're supposed to talk for five minutes or so, but I'm running out of stuff to say. Um, <laughs> um, so. Fast forward, uh, when I when I came up to uh, to uh, North Dakota, uh, I met Anna, and she started working on uh, on my deportation hearings and went to court with me. Uh, we went to uh, Bloomington in Minnesota or something, Minneapolis, and she stood up for me and presented the case. She did such a great job. Um, basically, the judges was just like it was pretty much shocked. They didn't even know really going on, but uh, eventually DACA was passed, uh, then uh, Anna got us on DACA, uh, we paid, you know, we paid the money and all that stuff, it's like $460, I think, to get on the DACA program, and we didn't even have much money because it wasn't working, but we tried all we could, some churches helped us out, uh, did some uh, under the table work to try to get some money for that, paid it, and uh, got on the DACA. Came, I, I was. I had a drop, uh, work permit, so I was finally able to work. Started working at OK Tires. Uh, went to the oil field, and while I was there, uh, Anna sent me some email about scholarships opening up for DACA students. I mean, what for DACA um, immigrants and things like that. So she said, "Do your best to apply for them. Just send me all the little links." So I mean, being out of school for six years, all of my Writing skills, math skills, all of that stuff was gone, man. I was just, I didn't even know how to start an essay up, you know, I didn't even want to write anything. But my little sister Grace, I don't know, some of you guys probably seen Grace, she made the news. Um, she helped me out, we wrote the essay, and I got the scholarship. So now I'm doing an online program, and we got the uh, DACA Dream Act um, scholarship program. So, uh, that's, that's about it for my story there. So I'm glad to be here. Thanks for everyone that you know, made, made it possible. That's an amazing story. Um, I, I'll go next, and I, I want to thank everybody that came here today to talk about this important issue. Um, I, I think it's especially important to have stories like Julie's because it, it really gives you an idea, um, a more living sort of story idea of what people have to go through um, when, they, when they're undocumented in this country just to survive. And I've been very outspoken about our broken immigration policies in the United States because I believe that these broken policies don't just affect undocumented people, they affect everybody in the community all the way through the community. Um, years ago when uh, they were going to make it a felony to cross into the United States undocumented, we held a protest on the bridge. Um, some of the people here were on that bridge uh, in, back in 2006 because um, we felt that it was very inhumane to criminalize the act of searching for a better life, which was essentially what we felt that that new immigration policy was doing, or to help those who were trying to make a better life for themselves. Um, and I'm, uh, I'm the kind of person that will break the law if it means that I'm helping to save a life, regardless of what that uh, policy may be, whether it be a local or federal policy. I don't believe that a human being's life 
is worth um, looking away from simply because they've been labeled as illegal, because they're still human beings and they still deserve to be treated as human beings. Um, the other thing that I'm really concerned about is that our policies have actually ushered in a new era where um, our detention of mostly undocumented people has been monetized through the private prison system so that people that come here that can't earn even a poverty wage, sometimes a family of two or three people undocumented living together can earn below what one person in this country earns for poverty wages. And yet, putting that same undocumented person in a prison that's been privatized for detention of immigrants can make the prison system $60,000 a year. And so it's really the value of that human life that I think we've we've lost sight of when we've made it so that a whole family of people can't earn what one person under the poverty level can earn in this country, yet that person can be turned into, monetized into making money for our system, our corporate privatized prison system to the tune of uh, tens of thousands of dollars per person. Um, the other thing is that the programs that were instituted to secure our borders, secure our communities, the Secure Communities Program has been really, um, well, it hasn't been carried out in the way that it was meant to. President Obama and the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Services, as well as ICE, they set out to stop the immigration of and or to deport people that were dangerous felons, people that um, met the priority of the federal government in being removed from this country. What actually turned out to happen was that 70% or more of the people that were being detained and then deported were people that had no criminal record and that were being stopped for things like you know, not having a light on your car working or you know, forgetting to turn a, uh, your turn signal on. And so what, what's actually happened is that in the process, uh, a whole bunch of people that had no criminal record have become criminals. And people that are desperate enough to reenter this country to be reunited with their family members, many of whom are citizens or legal US residents, end up becoming <coughs> felons that can never enter into our community again. And there are people right here in our Fargo-Moorhead community that that has happened to. Um, I will mention uh, Miguel Barderas and his wife Gracie by name because they were and still are very important parts of our community except that Gracie now lives in Mexico and can never be reunited with her family. And her only crime was being undocumented. The federal government refused to allow her husband to sponsor her saying that he didn't have a secure enough position but many times for Mexican people or people of color in this country, the only jobs that they can get are the types of jobs that they've been typically given in the construction, the you know, agribusiness type of jobs that people can get, they're seasonal. And so for those reasons and the many other complications that go along with applying for and the costs that go along with um, getting status, he was not able to sponsor his wife even though they've been married for 20 some years and all their children and grandchildren are legal US citizens and she lives separated from her family. Another thing that's really important for people to remember is that um, all, U all US citizens like myself, I was born in Houston, Texas, um, we all have undocumented members of our family. 15% of us have at least one person that is undocumented in our families. Most of us have more people that are undocumented in our families. And despite the fact that I am a US citizen, that border and the policies of, that go 
along with scaring people into believing that building this giant metal fence that's full of holes like Swiss cheese <laughs> is really going to keep us safer somehow. Um, it, it, it's the kind of fear mongering that goes along with the, um, the, the terroristic type of threats that we hear so much about since 9-11. And it's the kind of fear mongering that puts all of our communities at risk. Because as a person of color, as a, a Mexican woman, I can't stop looking Mexican. And I can't not sound like a Mexican when I'm talking to my families in Spanish, which I frequently do. Nor can they stop sounding like Mexicans or like foreigners that might possibly be undocumented because even though they're all U.S. citizens, my parents have accents. I fought very hard to get rid of mine because I always wanted to make sure I sounded like a white person. I wanted people to not be able to tell that I was a Mexican if they were talking to me on the phone so I wouldn't be stigmatized. But regardless of the fact that I am a U.S. citizen, I am still t stigmatized. And every person of color in our communities that is a resident or a legal US citizen is still stigmatized. Many of our people, my mother has been pulled over seven times in the last year. She's a legal US citizen. That shouldn't happen, but it does. And those kinds of profiling um, problems have grown incredibly, as have the number of hate groups in this country since 9-11. I think the figure was that it had gone up something like 700%. Those are things that, um, as a community, I feel that we need to address by changing the way that we think about how we fix the immigration problem. Um, I believe that this um, move by the president was one of kindness, was one of compassion. It doesn't go nearly far enough to do what the millions and millions of people in this country who have to hide like Julie talked about, who have to be afraid every time they get in their car and have to go from point A to point B for work or whatever. Um, but it's a step in the right direction. And so I hope that those of you who work with um, populations that are stigmatized, that you help to change that conversation in our community and to um, impart um, a sense of moral um, correctness in our country as opposed to us focusing so much on being a nation of laws that we actually be a nation of people that have a moral compass and that have a sense of humanity toward other human beings, which I think this program is a first step toward providing. So again, I thank you all for being here. I'm going to let somebody that has uh, a better uh, voice to speak from on the moral standing, Pastor Sue, um, talk a little bit about that. Thank you. Um, I want to just start with a disclaimer. Um, <laughs> I'm here filling in for my good friend Peter Schmidt, who has much, much more experience in these issues than I do. Peter, unfortunately, was taken ill this afternoon and was unable to be here, and so Cindy called and asked if I would would be here uh, in his stead, and so I'm happy to do that. But I did want to begin with a disclaimer to say that I'm, I'm not the kind of expert in this area that my friend Peter is. I do, however, want to talk about a few things having to do with my own experience, and then generally about my history, and then I want to take us in to a consideration of the moral and ethical considerations, particularly scriptural mandates, because that's kind of the world in which I live and the lens through which I view things, and what that might have to say um, about these issues of immigration, of undocumented people. I, like Cindy, I dislike the word illegal, <laughs> uh, undocumented people, and about the, the richness that I believe that comes to our country and to our community when we uh, include neighbors from all over the world in our daily lives. So to begin with, um, my mother is from Texas. She's the youngest of 12 children. And when I was um, growing up, um, I was sent to Texas to spend time with my mother's family because she thought 
it would be good for me not to grow up a city kid, and she was right. Um, and it was in those years that I had my first um, experience uh, with people who were from another country, primarily from Mexico, and many of whom were undocumented. I didn't know the word for it at that time. Um, and began to have a feel for the struggles that they faced simply because they lacked um, a perceived legitimacy that I had simply by virtue of having been born to people who had been in this country longer. So that was sort of my first exposure to these issues, and that's a long time ago now, but it was formative to me. And for whatever reason, I seemed to be hardwired for justice and ingrained on me even when I was a young person, that that was not right. I said that um, I became aware that there were people who didn't have access to the things that I had access to simply because my forebearers had been in this nation longer. But I do want to talk a little bit about the experience of some of my forebearers, my Texas forebearers particularly. My grandfather uh, came to the United States um, in the late 1800s, uh, and he was a first generation uh, American coming here. He worked his way over on a boat. He courted my grandmother, and his uh, selling point was that he had learned to crochet buttons, and she thought that was a very useful skill. <laughs> they married uh, shortly after the turn of the century and settled in a community that had many other German immigrants. There's stories in my family of how my mother's elder siblings all spoke German, and they spoke German in the house when they were growing up. But by the time my mother came, no German was spoken in the house. And the reason for that was that my mother was born in 1926 after the First World War, and her elder siblings were born prior to that. And during the First World War, there was a wave of fear that spread across the country of people of German origin and who spoke the German language as the fear was that they were spies and they were dangerous. In my family, there is a story of, I think, an aunt or perhaps a great aunt of mine who had quilts taken off the clothesline and burned because a neighbor suspected that she was somehow sending secret messages in the quilts and the manner in which they were hung on the line. Apparently, sometimes she hung them in one way and another time she hung them in another, and it was believed that somehow she was sending information to those who were part of it. Seems ludicrous, yeah, I see you laughing, but that's something that people who are new to this country in a variety of times and ways have experienced. My next experience with this came while I was in my seminary studies and I needed to do a cross-cultural education uh, event, and so I spent a uh, better part of uh, three weeks in El Paso and in, in Juarez as part of an immersion. Um, and I learned then things that have continued to shape how I do this. Uh, things about the push-pull, <laughs> the economic factors that push people out of their country of origin, seeking a better life, seeking safety, seeking access um, to basic human needs and services, safety, and the pull of the perceived wealth of our country and the way that that pulls people, right? So there's this push-pull. During that time there, I visited with a number of folks who were undocumented and heard about their struggles to live in the United States as undocumented people and the, the daily fear that they might be discovered and deported and separated, perhaps permanently, from their families. And the fear of parents who had children who were born here and therefore were legal and that they were not legal and that that might cause a separation at some point. During my time at Elam <coughs> as pastor, that's where I served, Elam Lutheran in downtown Fargo, my um, experience and my connection with folks who are in this country and are undocumented 
is primarily people who come to me and they are seeking help with basic daily necessities, food baskets and other things. I was really, really happy when one of the local food pantries changed the regulation a number of years ago that required that those who were seeking a food basket had to have a social security number. They no longer require that and I, that made me so happy because the idea that someone who was in need of food might be unable to receive that from an agency whose vision and mission is to provide food in emergency situations because they lacked a social security number has always struck me as um, just completely unjust. I'm also pretty much a native Fargo. Um, I spent some time, as I said, growing up in Texas. But my family moved to Fargo when I was six years old, and with the exception of a period of about 17 years when we lived all the way in the foreign land of Fergus Falls, Minnesota, <laughs> I have been a Fargo. -like. The Fargo that I live in now is very different than the one I grew up in. And it's different in ways that I think bring great richness to this community. I absolutely love being able to go somewhere and hear different languages being spoken and see the diversity around me. And I think that our community is a richer place because of it. I had a, a professor at seminary, Old Testament prof, uh, Terry Fredheim, who used to say that he thought that God was crazy for diversity, just crazy for variety. Otherwise, why would God have made us in so many different shapes and sizes and hues and all of the different giftedness that we have? I think that's right. I think God is crazy for variety and diversity. And maybe we should be as well. But finally, I want to take just a moment to talk about our history as a people of the book. And by the book, I mean the Bible, the scriptures. In the book of Deuteronomy, when Moses is speaking to the people, he speaks about how it is that they are to treat strangers in their midst. In Deuteronomy 10.16, it's written, Circumcise them the foreskin of your heart and do not be stubborn any longer. For the Lord your God is a God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, who loves the strangers, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land. Those of us who are of the Abrahamic faiths trace our roots to uh, Abraham, who classified himself as a wandering Aramean who went down into Egypt, a stranger in a strange land. And in the Old Testament, the Hebrew people are commanded again and again to provide care for the stranger and the alien in their midst. Or wants to be a stranger. And then finally, when Jesus is questioned about what the greatest commandment is, he says, You are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and you are to love your neighbor as yourself. And he does not draw crisp, clean lines about who he is. In fact, he goes on to tell a story in which the neighbor is the one who shows mercy, not the one who is familiar. So I, I believe strongly that we need to reform this immigration system of ours, and in the reform, we need to be guided not by fear, not by self-interest, but by the conviction that every human being has intrinsic value and worth, 
simply by virtue of being human, and that everyone has gifts to bring to the community, and that when all are included in the community, the community is a richer place, and all that. Thus ends the sermon. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, well, I think it's really important to go over the basics of what is involved in these new programs. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Anna to talk more in detail about that. And then we'll have everybody else uh, get a chance to ask questions. Okay, I want to spend just a couple of minutes kind of talking about how did how did we get here? Um, you know, in kind of and Julia's told his story, and Ferry has talked about this broken immigration system, and you know, and for decades we, and I'll go, we, you know, have talked about and claimed that our immigration system is, is broken. Um, most recently, in 2013, the United States Senate actually passed a comprehensive immigration reform bill that went to the House of, went to the House where it was never got on the House floor, and thereupon died. Um, again, for decades, we've talked about something that's called the DREAM Act, the Development, Relief, and Education for Alien Minors. For individuals like Julie, who came to the U.S. not on choice, but were usually brought with by their parents. Some of them came legally, some of them did not, and grew up here and went to school here. And in terms of going, well, it's not necessarily fair to all of a sudden have them become adults and go, you don't get to go to school anymore, you don't get to drive, you don't get to work. Um, several times over the last couple of decades, the DREAM Act has been introduced as legislation that would allow a path towards a green card or towards citizenship for especially the young, undocumented individuals. However, today and again, that legislation has not um, passed Congress. <clears throat> and every president in recent immigration history, dating back to the 1940s, has instituted its priorities in terms of how, how does the United States government enforce its immigration laws. Um, and for decades, we've talked about something that would, that's called deferred action. Like, okay, we recognize that somebody's here without permission, but in terms of our, our priorities, we don't, want, you know, these are the, we prefer to put our limited resources here as opposed to there. Um, you know, most recently, as Cindy had alluded to, President Obama, every president takes a different stance. Um, president Bush had a tendency to do, to enforce its immigration laws by targeting large employers who were known to having undocumented, individ, uh, undocumented individuals working for them. That led to a lot of workplace rates where immigration would go in into somebody's workplace and say, show me your papers or we're, we're taking you out. Kind of, and that's how the individual, the Indian men um, were picked up in Castleton. Of, of course, many people said, well, that's really not fair because we're going and picking up these people and these children are being left at home. Um, President Obama took a, we want to work on focusing on deporting our criminals first. Let, let's focus on keeping families and people who have been here a long time. You know, let's give them the option. Um, so early on in, in his presidency, he established, here's how my, you know, department is going to enforce immigration laws. Um, and it seemed to me, even though we were, we were being told they were focusing on criminals, it seemed like the people who had the least amount of criminal history were being picked up in a variety of, of different ways. Fast forward to June 15, 2012, President Obama made an announcement called DACA, Deferred Action for Children or Childhood Admissions. Um, and that program, the original DACA has been in place since 2012. Um, um, and so, th so that DACA program has been around for a while. And fast forward a little bit further, uh, November 20th, 2014, President Obama made sweeping executive actions, and this is the, the power of the executive branch to determine how it's going to enforce its laws. Um, within that executive action were actually 10 different um, targeted programs for immigration included in expand, 
expansion of the DACA program, and the introduction of DAPA, which is the Deferred Action for Parents of Americans. Fast forward a little bit later, um, 26 um, highly Republican states filed suit against President Obama in the district, in one of the district, federal district courts in Texas, challenging the president's authority uh, to introduce and continue on the DAPA and DAPA immigration program. Um, that district judge in Texas has put an injunction on the rollout of the expanded DAPA and the DAPA programs. So right now, some of the things that we're going to be talking about, we can't do yet. Um, fast forward a little bit later, the, uh, President Obama in turn filed an injunction with the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals um, asking the Court of Appeals to lift the injunction of these programs. You know, so right now, um, the immigrant, this piece of immigration action uh, is making its way through the court system. So some of these programs that we're going to talk about aren't things that we can apply for today, but it's something that we're trying to get the word out to try and make sure that people know that they're eligible for these different programs um, and to be able to, to start to be able to, to like Julie come out of the shadows. Um, okay, so that's kind of how, um, how we got here. This executive action and like the DACA program and the DAPA program it's not law. It's basically the, the president and the, the federal administration um, determining how it's going to use its limited immigration resources in enforcing and implementing immigration law. Uh, it doesn't allow individual, it, it's not a long-term solution, it's not a path for somebody to get a green card, and it's not a path for somebody to get citizenship. It's a temporary protection that in many cases allows individuals to come out of the shadows um, that a guarantee as long as they stay out of trouble they're not going to be deported allows them the ability to work legally in the u.s get a social security card um, and in many states be able to get a driver's license for the first time okay um, and all of these programs are discretionary the you have to call it, you have to show that you've earned the ability to receive that protection and that, that work authorization. So that's kind of what we're talking about now isn't, isn't anything that's law. It's more of a protection and an enforcement priority. Um, we'll, we'll start with, I'll call it the original DACA. Um, you had to have been under 31 on June 15th, 2012. You have to prove that you came to the U.S. before the age of 16. You had to show that you continuously resided in the U.S. since June 15, 2007, um, and that you were physically present and without immigration status on June 15, 2012. Um, you need to show that you're either in school, have a GED, a high school diploma, or have some sort of mili U.S. military service. And you have to show that you didn't, you don't have a felony, significant misdemeanor, um, three or more misdemeanors, or are otherwise a threat to the public safety. Of, um, and so, actually, over at the table, there's the most recent st statistics um, for individuals who have qualified for the original DACA program. Um, so. The, the president's announcement in November of 2014 expanded that DACA program. Um, it removed the age cap because before it, it seemed somewhat unfair that if you were if you turned um, 31 on June uh, June 14th, you could be ineligible. Um, the expanded DACA remo um, removed the upper age limit. So it allows people who are, came, who are older but were still young, were still kids when they came here to qualify. Um, and under the expanded DACA, they have to show that they've been in the U.S. since 2010. So it didn't, not going back quite as far. And again, there, there's still the um, educational component and showing that you lack a criminal history. Um, the other one is the, the DAPA program, which is expanding the idea of, of the DACA program to parents. 
Um, and that's one where we know the least about at this point because it's, it's um, before the lawsuit, it wasn't pre projected to be able to take effect until May. So we're still a little bit further out on that. But again, you have to show that you've been in the U.S. since at least um, January 1st, 2010, that you were physically present in the U.S. In no on November 20th, 2014, um, and that you didn't have any lawful status, and that as of that November 20th, 2014 date, you have a son or daughter who is either a permanent resident or a U.S. citizen. And again, the idea of this enforcement priority is that we're going to give protection to parents who have children who are here legally. Um, and, and so kind of the programs that are rolling out, again, they're not long-term fixes, they're short-term, but they do allow people to come out of the shadows to be able to, to get work authorization, to be able to get a driver's license, to get a social security card so that they don't feel like they're living in the shadows anymore. And I think with, the, with that, that's kind of the programs that we're talking about, and we can open it up for questions, comments, discussion. I did want to mention, um, as Anna stated, that there are handouts in the back for those of you who'd like to take some of those home. And they're in, in Spanish and English. You can take more than one if you'd like. There are also business cards back there for at least for Barry and for Anna. So if you guys would like to chat with them further after today, you can do that as well. And I, I noticed some people taking notes. Um, a lot of the information that you heard us talking about, uh, specifically with regard to the DAC and DACA programs and the qualifications, those are available in podcast form on our YouTube channel. And you can find them by finding the People's Press Project at fmppp.org online. That's fmppp, as in People's Press Project, dot org. Or you can find us on Facebook, and then you'll be able to see the uh, podcast. You can listen, and they're available in Spanish and English. So um, folks can keep up to date. We'll be continuing to do more of those, and we will also be trying to hold more town hall meetings so people can ask questions. So I'll let folks ask questions if they have any now. Oh, come on, guys, we have to have questions. Uh, kind of in terms of numbers, and again, the it, I shouldn't say it shouldn't shock me. Um, North Dakota is towards the bottom in terms of individuals who have actually received DACA protection um, to the tune of less than 70 individuals. And I don't necessarily think that's because that there aren't individuals there. I think, unfortunately, we haven't done a very good job of spreading the word throughout the state of North Dakota to let people know that there is this program and to help them determine whether or not they're qualified. Um, you know, in, in the Minneapolis area, there's you know at least a half a dozen organizations who are out doing workshops and seminars much like ours to spread the word into the communities to make people feel safe and going forward. Where Know, those of you who are helping individuals, just make sure that you continue to spread the word because I think all of us up here know that there's more individuals who are, who are qualified for these programs, but at this point they either don't know, lack the resources, or lack, or lack the tools to be able to even apply. And they're still afraid. And they're still afraid. Yeah, yes. and I actually, when, when I uh, paired up with Anna and started talking to folks in the community about doing this, I would like to mention the fact that I went to a lot of uh, leaders in uh, the Mexican community that have either legal backgrounds or are working on immigration stuff, advocacy work, and said, hey, you want to come and talk about this thing in the community and this will make people feel more comfortable and coming out and asking questions. And they were like, that would be great, but my employer will not let me talk about that. So they're themselves restricted from coming out publicly and making people in our community that look up to them as leaders, they're restricted from talking about this issue. And furthermore, um, I said to Anna, I think a lot of the folks that would be able to, to, 
to benefit from this will feel very afraid of how people in this community will react mm -hmm. to public meetings about this issue. Um, I wish they were here today because they would be pleasantly surprised that there, there was such a, uh, a warm reception for what we had to say. The other thing is that I think that um, it's going to take some time of this information being out in the public, hopefully disseminated through folks like yourselves, um, so that they feel comfortable showing up at one of these town halls and asking questions of their own. Or they can also feel free to contact either myself, Duke, and or Anna, and um, any of the panel here would be happy to refer you to where you can get information. Yes, Bonnie. Um, so these aren't laws. So what happens if um, Congress does ever pass a law that is different for certain people or you know, a small group or whatever, and then what happens so I might be reluctant to come out here because I'd be afraid of the law. There would be a law, not an education. Yeah. No, and, and and that's and that's a that's a good question, and it has been a concern. And that's you know, like I will visit with clients and say, you're qualified for this now, but some you know, the law could change. You know, the the pre you know at this point we know that you know. The DACA, and the, DACA, the DACA program is good for President Obama's administration. Now, the those that are far more skilled and political than I say it's going to be a pretty hard argument for the next president to just get a, to do away with the program because all of a sudden you say, well, wait a second, we're going to deport these hundred of thousand people we've given protection because they've been here a long time. They don't have any crimes. We're now going to deport them over people who do have criminal history, and so it's one of those. We don't know what's going to happen in the future, but it seems hard to believe that, especially these groups of people, are, are going to receive some sort of political protection in the future. If not, going whether it's whether it's you and I or whether it's the Hispanic community and the other immigrant communities who speak with their vote to say, no, we're, we're not going to take that. Um, and that's where, too, I've encouraged people, too, to apply if they're eligible, because if the law passes, one of the requirements might be that you previously had, you know, the doctor or the DAPA eligibility. So, it, yeah, it's kind of, you know, at this point, you know, it's temporary, but that, and I think part of it too is when we can see the success of giving, you know, in the